If I had to describe Bloodborne and the mythology behind it, I would say that I, and certainly others, have experienced something known as pathos. It's the feeling of enjoyment from something so revolting, or in other words, being unable to look away from something unpleasant. Experiencing the horror and allure of Bloodborne is something I never thought that I'd experience in a video game. This is especially true when it comes to Bloodborne's Great Ones, the supernatural cosmic beings that shape the planes of the existence of Yharnam. However, these Great Ones have a defining trait between them that comes from the mythology that inspired them. For the uninitiated, Bloodborne is a third-person action and adventure game that has been out since 2015, and has been critically acclaimed for its gothic, attractive setting, gameplay, and story. Though not explicitly shown to us or experienced as in some games, instead it's learned through careful inspection. To understand the game further and how the Great Ones fit into Bloodborne's lore, let's give some brief context. As the hunter, you come to the town of Yharnam, suffering from an unknown illness seeking to be cured by the famous Old Blood. However, you agree to join in the annual hunt of the town. Witnessing true horror as men turn into beasts, women give birth to stillborn monstrosities, and bear witness to beings that blur the lines between the dreamlands and reality. Finally reaching a crossroads to either embrace the dream, awake and return to the real world, or ascend to a level of higher existence. What Bloodborne truly tells the tale of, without us realizing it, is how and ultimately what the Great Ones truly are. It's these beings that we seek to further understand, their purpose, their history, and their mythology. Before we continue, I want to mention that I'll be covering multiple pieces of the puzzle that is Bloodborne's mythology, as well as the characters in future videos. So if that's something that interests you, then be sure to subscribe and let me know what you think. The Great Ones, as they're called throughout Yharnam, are supernatural cosmic beings that control and alter reality for the townspeople. Not only this, but it's through their blood that cures for diseases were found. However, these have disastrous effects on people, as many of the people violently turn into beasts or succumb to a fate worse than death. All of them with the desire to reach the level of these cosmic beings, many of whom connect to or are directly inspired by the master of cosmic horror, H.P. Lovecraft, helping us learn more about the expansive mythology of Bloodborne and their Great Ones. One of the first cosmic beings encountered in Bloodborne is the ever-present Amygdala, a spindly and spider-like monster that has eyes throughout its brain. These beings cannot be perceived at first, but as you progress through Yharnam, you gain insight into their existence. It's here that we can understand our first connection. In the short story, The Whisper in the Darkness, Lovecraft describes an advanced race of beings known as the Migo. Within the story, and multiple mentions in others, the Migo are described as winged insectoids, with hair-like tendrils covering its body. However, on Earth, these cosmic beings cannot fly very well, and must resort to crawling over the landscape. These resemble the amygdala, as both maintain an insect-like physicality. Additionally, the amygdala shares another aspect with another Lovecraftian species, the spawn of Yogg-Sothoth. These beings do not exactly resemble the amygdala physically, but both are initially invisible to those lacking insight to its existence. As within Bloodborne, it is only when you gain 40 insight or more that you are able to actually comprehend their physical existence. The same can relatively be said of the spawn of Yogg-Sothoth. Interestingly, they share a commonality with the Greco-Roman and Christian mythology, in addition to their connection to Lovecraft's mythos. In Greek myth, we come across a giant that was said to have had 100 eyes. 
remaining vigilant over the mortal Io. In Hesiod's Agimios, he states, And set a watcher upon her, great and strong Argus, who with four eyes looks every way. Sleep never fell upon his eyes, but he kept sure watch always. Within Bloodborne, the amygdala are the watchers of the Great Ones, stationed throughout Yarnum observing the hunters, beasts, and many others below them. Sadly for Argus, he would be slain by the messenger god Hermes, working with Zeus in an effort to court Io. According to the Roman poet Ovid, Argus, being Hera's faithful watchman, had Argus's hundred eyes taken and preserved upon the male peacock tail feathers in an effort to immortalize him. There is, however, a different connection to the amygdala within Christian mythology, and the forms of God's angels, specifically the Othanum. According to the book of Ezekiel 1, they were made of wheels covered in eyes that moved in conjunction, maintaining their gaze on whatever they observed. The notion of eyes is a constant within Bloodborne, as acquiring more eyes on the inside or on the brain is sought after by the Bergenworth head scholar Willem and the school of Mensis head Mikolash. Both believe that gaining these eyes, both physically and mentally, would allow them to gain the proper insight or knowledge to perceive the Great Ones, allowing them to live on and ascend to become Great Ones themselves. Within the peak of Hunter's Nightmare lives a dank and seemingly abandoned village that is nearly submerged by the sea. This fishing hamlet has a deep secret to it that pertains to the Great One that resides there, or rather, lay there. Kos, or sometimes referred to as Kossum, is a long-dead Great One that was believed to be slain by the old hunters of ages past. As the being lay washed up on the beach, it slowly began to change people of the small village into monstrous fish people, driven mad by their transformation. The people of the fishing hamlet, and Koss itself, are inspired directly by Lovecraft's story, The Shadow Over Innsmouth, where we find a town devoid of normalcy, revealing the existence of creatures known as Deep Ones living amongst the homes and shops. The Deep Ones were immortal and supernatural beings that were the foul amalgamations of fish and man. The story found that people were bred with the Deep Ones, with their offspring becoming more and more like the Deep Ones over time, increasing their maddening numbers. These Deep Ones and the people of the fishing hamlet connect with the Yakaruna of Amazonian folklore. Believed to live among the Amazon basin, the Yakaruna are fish-like people with bluish-green skin and are viciously territorial of their rivers. It's believed that they would mainly target fishermen and hunters, while on occasion capturing women to impregnate, furthering their numbers throughout the Amazon. As for Kos itself, you come to find that even as it lay dead through supernatural means, it still gives birth to an orphan. It's unknown who or even what the father is, but with this birthing, the physical look of the orphan of Kos, we can make connections to the Virgin Mary, as it is believed that both became pregnant through divine means. Additionally, as Kos lay by the shore, it glows with a bright white sheen to show its godliness, much like Mary is shown to glow or glisten in Christian artwork, both of whom give birth to an angelic man whose death would free the people of their land. Moreover, the Orphan of Kos is a great one that is distinctly human in comparison to its mother. The Orphan of Kos is a herald for the atrocities the old hunters had committed against the small village and Kos itself. This is more or less the reason for its distinctive look, revealing to be the manifestation of hatred and despair as its cries and screams share with you the pain and suffering experienced. Unlike its fellow Great Ones, the Orphan of Kos does not exhibit deformities of eyes or unnatural body proportions. In terms of its connections to Lovecraft's mythos and the greater mythology of the world, this is a bit more difficult to pin down. Though not directly connected to the Lovecraft mythos, Junji Ito's story The Thing That Drifted Ashore does share similarities to not only Kos, but to its orphan as well. 
The story tells of a mysterious snake-like creature washing onto a shore in Japan, already dead and decaying. As people begin to investigate it, they find that people lost at sea had made their way inside the creature. Being freed, these people are incapable of coherent thought, making only grunts or screams, acting as zombies driven mad, just as the orphan of Kos is incapable of coherent speech, and is so psychologically damaged that its aggression is unmatched. Fighting this great one along the banks of the fishing hamlet, a peculiar transformation happens to it. As when reaching half of its health, the orphan bellows in anger and gains eldritch yet strikingly angelic wings. This potentially ties into the Christian belief as Jesus was born to the Virgin Mary and cried out in anguish during his final moments, shouting, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As Christ hung from the cross, he called out to God in pain, expressing his humanity in full looking to the heavens for answers, but seeing only the darkness and solidarity. This is similar to the Orphan of Kos, as the cutscene revealing the Great One depicts it crying out as it stares into the darkness of the nightmare it lives in, crying at the moon that watches intently, forsaking the only living birth among the Great One. When dying, the Orphan of Kos disappears, but what remains close to the body of its mother is the lingering spirit or will of the being, connecting once again to the rising of the Holy Spirit after Christ's death. Within another nightmare of Yarnum lies the school of Mensis, an antagonistic school that strove to forcibly gain the means of ascension to the level of the Great Ones. However, lying within the nightmare, the school and its headmaster, Mikolash, found the Great One that was capable of driving any with a shred of humanity to the brink of insanity, a Great One known as the Brain of Mensis, a living and amorphous amoeba of eyes and flesh. This being was capable of causing frenzy to any that was caught in its gaze, forcibly rupturing the victim's blood from their body. The look of this being can be derived from the cosmic entity within Lovecraft's mythos known as yogg sothoth Described within the mythos as a mass of eyes, orbs, and flesh living just outside the known universe, a being of omniscience, able to observe all and see within and around our world. In myth, the mere sight of yogg sothoth had been said to drive a person to insanity, into a frenzy that melts or ruptures any coherent thought the person might have had. Both the brain of Mensis and yogg sothoth are worshipped as gods and utilized to aid their worshippers in continuing their occult practices. Within world mythology in relation to the brain of Mensis, we can actually find multiple connections that it can be associated with. The first is within Greek myth, as there lives two spirits that personify insanity and frenzy, the Mania and Lysa, both of whom are daughters of Nyx who have associations with the rabies virus that plagues both man and beast. As rabies infects the brain of its hosts, they become more and more frenzied, to the point that their body gives out and dies. As well, with the daughters of the primordial of night and darkness, they connect with the brain of Mensis and its surrounding school, as the nightmare that surrounds it lies in perpetual night, with only the moonlight as its guiding light. Another connection seen within the world of mythology ties to the name Mensis, as it is the Latin word for the month, or to put it bluntly, the time of the month that a woman would experience menstruation. Within Hindu mythology, there is the goddess Kamakya, who rules over all desires of deities and mortals alike. The temple of her worship annually celebrates the goddess's menstruation, witnessing the statues in her honor bleed. These expressions on the female cycle played into the notion of blood, being of the utmost importance, but also as some of the most hazardous. This connection goes further with the cycle of menstruation, 
as the brain of Mensis holds the item Living String, which may be interpreted as an umbilical cord, showing the importance of blood flow into the plausibility of new life. Among the deep and dark void of space, time, and dreams lives a formless entity that speaks to its followers, giving insight into their desires as they both corrupt and ascend the people they work through. The formless Great One, known as Edon, serves as one of the highest of the ascended among the deities of Bloodborne. As Edon has no physical form, instead speaking through and to their followers. Furthermore, Edon will at times select some from their following in an effort to produce offspring. Within Lovecraft's mythos, there are some that follow this same work in aspects of the formless Edon. The formless Great One connects to the outer god Azathoth, a supremely omnipotent being that calls and speaks to not only its followers, but those it wishes to control and manipulate. It is never truly seen by those it communes with, but takes on different and more unusual forms each time, being essentially formless, as its physical form can only be assumed. The other of Lovecraft's mythos Edon connects back to is with again the monstrous and amorphous yogg sothoth I've previously discussed them here, but the takeaway is that he communes with his zealots and cultists to further his goals, speaking even to those it wishes to manipulate to joining its order, wanting ever more to grow in power over the cosmos and the lesser beings in it. As for real-world mythology, there are two distinct cases that link Edon in interesting ways. Firstly, with the Greek primordial being Chaos, this was the first being to come into existence, and would voice its will on existence. Chaos is usually depicted as a dense fog or mist around the earth, coating the skies above man. Chaos is also said to have been formless, existing as a nebulous abyss, as the Greek word for chaos can, in literal terms, mean a vast void or emptiness. In addition to the link to Greek mythology, there is another that ties to the formless Edon. Oedipus, the king of Thebes, driven mad from the gained insight of his lineage, strongly connects to the Bloodborne Great One, as both share the prefix of their name, meaning swollen, referencing the expansion of the mind. In the story of Oedipus Rex, the king of Thebes is driven mad by fulfilling the prophecy at birth, a prophecy that stated that he would murder his own father, marry his own mother, and bear children with her. Upon learning this horrid truth, Oedipus would mutilate himself, tearing out his eyes, unable to bear the thought of seeing the world before him, as his newfound insight was too much to handle. This couples with the Great One Edon, as many of his followers wear bandages over their eyes, a sign of the mutilation they bore from the insight given to them by the Great One. One of the more eerie points throughout Bloodborne that we talked about earlier is the nightmare of the school of Mensis. The unsettling nature of it is not only brought about by gothic structures littering the landscape, nor the monsters living within the nightmare. Instead, reaching the top of this nightmare, we begin to hear the unsettling sound of a baby crying. You may begin to ask yourself, how could a baby exist here, in this nightmare? However, it's this baby, Murgo, and its protector, Murgo's wet nurse, that have created the entirety of the nightmare. It's crying, echoing out the suffering it experiences, 
and forcing others to experience it as well. In Lovecraft's story, The Dunwich Horror, we learn of the two offspring of the deity yogg sothoth The first, Wilbur, is generally the more human of the two, showing a high level of intelligence and maturity, but grows at an exceptional rate, worrying neighbors whom he interacts with. The other is an invisible entity that is sequestered in a barn nearby, growing larger as each day passes. Eventually freed, the invisible horror causes terror in the town nearby, calling out to yogg sothoth for aid before meeting its untimely end. These two, Wilbur and the Horror, are one of the direct inspirations for the baby Murgo and its wet nurse. We can recognize this due to a few key aspects. First, Murgo is never truly seen and is only heard, existing within a Victoria-era pram or child stroller atop the Nightmare of Mensis. As for Murgo's wet nurse, it has an unusual body, as all that is really seen of it are its arms, cloak, and wings, maintaining a sense of concealment. Even during your fight against the wet nurse, it can shroud the battlefield in darkness, making it even more concealed to us. On top of this, we never get to actually see Murgo, as it's believed that they are in fact formless, like their father. Another aspect of Murgo and its wet nurse is that both share the same shape, more or less, to Wilbur and his horror. As Murgo perpetuates a shred of humanity with its cries echoing throughout the nightmare. However, for the wet nurse, this being is monstrous and barely shows anything akin to humanity, reminding us of the true horror we are experiencing. Thirdly is Murgo's supposed father, the Great One, Edon, as Edon is completely formless, he invokes his will and seed onto others without physical interaction. This links with the fact that both Wilbur and the Horror are the offspring of the Great One, yogg sothoth the inspiration for the Great Edon. Having said that, Murgo and Murgo's wet nurse share interesting parallels with the Slavic folklore and Judeo-Christian mythology alongside its Lovecraftian inspirations. Unsurprisingly, not many of the myths or folklore touch on the subject of stillborns. However, within Slavic folklore, the Pronyak is formed from a stillborn fetus, a demon that is believed to have an unprecedented amount of power as their grasp on reality was never fully realized. This becomes apparent as the stillborn Murgo is the one responsible for the nightmare that so many are bound to. Moreover, the Pronyak is specifically formed due to improper birth, dying in the process, and not being properly buried beneath the home. As Murgo lies in the pram atop the nightmare and the mansion of the Tumerian queen, their mother, it did not receive the proper burial, subsequently turning it into the Pronyak that we witness. To add to this, in Slavic folklore, a Pronyak can turn into a divine and somewhat dangerous spirit known as a Klobuk. This spirit cares for the home where the fetus resided for most of its unborn life, protecting both itself and its home fiercely. These spirits were said to generally take the form of an enraged rooster or hen. They've even been known to shape themselves into crows with razor-like talons. This couples with the thought that, as we see Murgo's wet nurse come to protect Murgo from us, considering us intruders in their home, Murgo's wet nurse shares the same talons as well with its sickle swords, black cloak, and black wings. Even as it lands surrounding Murgo, it doesn't land with the same power as some others in Bloodborne, instead landing like a bird, cushioning its landing to quiet its feet. In terms of Murgo and their wet nurse's connection to Judeo-Christian mythology, it's actually something that I'll be covering in a separate video, so make sure you're subscribed because you don't want to miss out on it. Ibrietas, the daughter of the cosmos, provided the necessary means to raise Yarnum to the status we come to learn throughout our journey. The beginning of it all in Bloodborne's history, the healing blood, the church, 
and the hunters themselves. She is the one who provided the old blood to heal those afflicted by deadly diseases and allow those imbibing in the blood of the Great Ones to reach new heights. Ibrietas was praised as the bringer of knowledge by the church as so many sought to ascend to her level of existence, alongside many other Great Ones. When we approach her, it's interesting to note that she has her back turned to us and does not acknowledge us, much like the Orphan of Kos did as we discussed before, meaning that she could either be praying or perhaps frozen in sadness, being the left behind Great One. As for Ibrietas' design, it truly reflects the cosmic horror that Lovecraft was so fond of. Fittingly, Ibrietas takes inspiration from the icon of Lovecraft's mythos, Cthulhu. This cosmic deity has been one of, if not the most popular, of all the cosmic entities we've discussed today. Introduced in the story The Call of Cthulhu, their design is a mishmash of animals and humans, having the head of an octopus, the wings of a dragon, and the body of a man. Ibrietas' body may not share the same aspect of a human body, but instead connects with their head being bulbous with tendrils hanging from it, creating an almost octopus look with them. On top of this, the rest of Ibrietas' body is like an octopus with multiple tentacles protruding in different directions. When Ibrietas was found by the old Yarnamites, she was not only discovered deep beneath the town, but alongside the ruins of an old city or civilization. This ties in with the fact that Cthulhu is often hidden deep beneath the earth, tied to the sunken city of Relay, a city that worshipped the cosmic deity much like Ibrietas was worshipped in the past, and may still be when we learn of their existence. Concerning Ibrietas' additional connections, we can link them back to Judeo-Christian mythology and Gnosticism. If you're unfamiliar with Gnosticism, I'll briefly explain it and its connections. In the first century CE, as Christianity began its rise, different sects among the Christians and Jews began to form, as different ways of thinking took hold. One such was Gnosticism, which turned away from the traditional belief of God in heaven and the devil in hell, instead believing that true salvation was gained through knowledge, or in more fitting terms, insight. That said, the Gnostics did believe in deities and higher powers, as found with the Demiurge, Samael, or Yaldaboath. The spirit or deity carrying the three names was depicted typically as a snake with the head of a lion. So, how does this connect with Ibrietas, you might be wondering? In design, Ibrietas does show some snake-like qualities, as her tentacles can move her around the arena. Along with this, her head has the look of a lion's mane, as it moves and attacks. As for the deeper connections, the Gnostics sought insight to gain salvation. In Bloodborne, it's through acquiring the blood of a great one, Ibrietas, that the humans were able to gain the needed insight to ascend. Even as she sits in wait, alone, deep within Yarnum, it again echoes the history of Gnosticism being claimed as heresy and left behind. That salvation, ascension, and insight are gained by other means. This finally brings us to our last true great one the one responsible for your experience through Yarnum, and potentially, your ascension. Solely responsible for the hunter's dream, and potentially the hunts you take part in, the Moon Presence is the true final boss to Bloodborne, and has different interactions depending on your playthrough. In one, you accept the Moon Presence and lay claim to the Hunter's Dream, taking the old Girnum's place as the next Hunter's Guide. The other has you fight and turn away from the Moon Presence, challenging it for its place as a Great One. However, the Moon Presence differs from so many of the other Great Ones we've discussed here because this is the only one that actively has the capacity to accept you and embrace you, claiming you as its potential arbiter. In design, the Moon Presence is almost half human and half Great One. 
its torso just being its spine and ribs, and its head shows no face with tendrils as hair. This look links with the Lovecraft outer god Nyarlathotep, spawn of the god Azathoth, and a great manipulator of man. Nyarlathotep is depicted as both a great one and as a man in many of the stories of Lovecraft. He is described as a tall and slender man that is dark in appearance, resembling an Egyptian pharaoh in stature. In addition to this, the outer god uses his power not only to get his way among the people of the earth, but to control the dreamlands, a physical place, and a metaphysical concept, which is a topic for another day. In terms of connections to the outer god, the moon presence shares its duality of the great ones and man, showing that they connect and commune with both. Even in your choice to join or challenge the moon presence, it ties with the Nyarthalatep who has seen man challenge him and many others who join his ranks among the cosmos. But these aren't the only connections, however. Throughout the many mythologies that have sprung up over the course of human history, each has had their own take on the moon, its presence, and dealings with mortals. In Greek mythology, there are two deities that correlate with the moon and its powers. Firstly, is with the Titan goddess and the personification of the moon itself, Selene. This goddess was the daughter of the Titans Hyperion and Thea, and is the one who drives the moon across the sky, opposite her brother Helios, the Titan god of the sun. It's believed that through Selene, that light was possible even during the night, as the moon's bright light illuminated the earth below, allowing so many to see when they otherwise could not, providing some semblance of insight. Additionally, being both the goddess of the moon and the light of it, we see this light when you interact with the moon presence, not only as it descends to you, but when it begins to embrace you. The light of the moon gives new life to an otherwise dark world. The second Greek deity is the goddess of the hunt Artemis. The goddess frequented the forests of the island of Delos, where she would hunt the beasts there. Many of the stories depicted her admiring those hunters just like herself. This links with the moon presence as it actively seeks out the hunters and rewards them with being its arbiter, the middleman between it and other hunters who enter the dream. As for the connection to the moon, it speaks to the thrill of the hunt. In the history of Yarnum, the hunters made their way through the dead of night to slay the beasts roaming about, beasts that the moon presence wanted to be slain by the hunters that it assisted. Artemis would do the same, using the light of the moon to help her get the upper hand on many of her hunts of the beasts of the forest. These connections cement their inspiration for the world of Yarnum, the people in it, and the great ones that surround it. From amygdala to the moon presence, each one of these true great ones have fascinating backgrounds and histories, both within their respective worlds and within ours. Bloodborne tells a story about gods and ascension, but also explains through its hidden history and lore that humanity has a deep-seated desire to seek out new knowledge or new insight. With that said, if you have a desire to learn more as well, then be sure to subscribe and join our community of gamers and historians. This is my most expansive and longest video to date, and you make it all possible. Thank you all so much, and I'll see you all next time.